we're on to our last session. Thanks everyone for being here. I'm gonna hand it over to Susie Thoreau. Okay, great. So good to see everyone. My name is Susie Thoreau. I'm a scientist here at SCORP. And so it's gonna be my pleasure to kick off our last session. Um, this one focused on environmental DNA methods. And for this introductory talk, I'm gonna do a little bit of environmental DNA 101 just so that we're all starting from the same place for uh, some of the great talks that we have following. And then I'll also be talking about a national strategy for environmental DNA uh, that some of us have been involved in developing over the past year or so, and some of the exciting um, ways that that has led us to developing this federal strategy that'll hopefully be bringing a lot of eDNA researchers together across the US. So with that, I always like to start um, with what is it when, what are we talking about when we talk about environmental DNA? So in its broadest sense, environmental DNA is really just any gen genetic material that we find present in the environment. And so that could be in water or in soil or even in air. And everything um, that's contributing to the eDNA pool that's present in a system can be anything from microbes to mammals. It could be algae. It could be benthic macroinvertebrates. And if they're multicellular organisms that eDNA is entering into the environment via shedding of skin cells, it could be gametes, it could be saliva, and all of that is contributing to this big um, pool of eDNA that then we can leverage for a better understanding biological communities present in the environment. If you're going to be analyzing an environmental DNA sample, it usually looks something like this. Uh, we start out by going out into the field. We're collecting a sample. Again, maybe that's just a liter of water that you're capturing, you're bringing it back to the lab, or maybe while on shore, you're gonna concentrate that environmental DNA down, usually using a filter or some sort of precipitation. Then you're gonna <clears throat> extract your eDNA and remove all of that other cellular debris so that you have some nice concentrated eDNA that then you can subject to your different analyses to probe who's present in your sample and how many different target organisms or target genes you may have. Two of the main ways that we're usually analyzing these environmental DNA samples is using a targeted approach where maybe we're looking specifically for individual genes or organisms and we want to quantify them with an approach like quantitative PCR or digital PCR. Or you're interested in a community-based analysis where you want to see all the different biodiversity present in your sample so you can look at all cyanobacteria species at once or all fish species at once and you're using a DNA metabarcoding approach to do so. Okay, so why are we often employing these environmental DNA-based tools for our biomonitoring and bioassessment? There are a couple of key features of these eDNA-based methods uh, that have led a number of people to begin piloting them in their different biomonitoring programs. One of the biggest ones is that we find these eDNA-based approaches can be really sensitive. So there's a reason that we use quantitative PCR for doing your COVID testing, and it's because we want to make sure that we can detect these organisms when they're in really low abundance. Um, or the presence of these genes when they're in really low abundance. Um, this is particularly relevant if you are doing invasive species monitoring or endangered species monitoring, and you really want to be able to detect these organisms um, when they're really rare uh, present in your system so that then you can enact some sort of management action or some follow-up um, studies. Additionally, we find these eDNA methods are really accurate. So they allow us to discriminate some really closely related taxa. We can get really species specific taxonomic assignment and sometimes identify organisms that otherwise we have difficulty doing with traditional microscopy or morphology based approaches. Um, by and large, eDNA based methods are pretty easy to do in terms of sampling out in the field. A lot of the approaches for sampling can be really non-destructive, and this is, again, important if we're looking at sensitive taxa who we don't want to disturb or destroy in uh, surveying for them. And then we can also take these eDNA samples and archive them. They can stay in our freezers for decades, or they can stay preserved in ethanol, um, and then we can return to them at some point in the future and sequence them or analyze them using qPCR um, to look back at those archived communities. Lastly, because of a lot of advantages and costs, sometimes these eDNA-based approaches can be an order of magnitude cheaper than our traditional morphology-based approaches. It means that we can scale our surveys across space and time and be collecting more samples um, and making hopefully bigger and better inferences about the biological communities and how they're changing um, with environmental perturbation. Okay, so in terms of some of the different research applications that we might uh, choose to employ these eDNA-based approaches, they span a range, everything from, as I mentioned, invasive and endangered species monitoring or fishery stock bioassessments, also um, looking at food webs or multi-trophic networks, uh, biodiversity surveys, harmful algal bloom monitoring is a really popular one, and of course, impact assessment or bioassessment surveys. 
we turn towards eDNA-based approaches for all of these different types of applications because we're able to zone in on information that we previously didn't have access to. So for something like invasive and endangered species, as I mentioned, these eDNA-based approaches can be really sensitive. We can detect these organisms when they're in really low abundance. For food webs and biodiversity surveys, we might be able to look at organisms we previously didn't have the ability to survey, um, something like microbes, or as we heard earlier today, the archaea or bacterial communities. Their role in the environment, we can finally highlight using these eDNA-based approaches. For harmful algal blooms, we can look at things like when the transcription of a toxin biosynthesis gene gets turned on or off. And so that's information we may not have had access to previously using traditional-based approaches. So really, we're turning to these eDNA-based tools because they're giving us access to something we didn't have previously. Okay, so for those reasons, eDNA-based tools have become increasingly popular over the past two decades. You can see in this figure here on the right-hand side of your screen um, that there's been, there's been this huge increase in the number of publications that are employing these eDNA-based methods for looking across a number of different disciplines and looking at all different sorts of biological community change. Um, but this growth in eDNA method adoption has occurred so rapidly that a lot of our method standardization just hasn't caught up yet. So we have multiple agencies and monitoring programs that are developing eDNA protocols to pilot in their surveys, but there's been broad scale, a lack of coordination of how these protocols are getting developed. And that's re uh, resulted in a number of silos within these agencies or monitoring programs where now we're generating data. It might be great, but we can't compare it to another agency program's data which limits our ability to link those data sets together and make some of those bigger, better inferences across uh, biological change across space and time. So now we're really trying to look towards a national level alignment of eDNA method development and standardization. To give you a snapshot of how bad it's gotten in terms of all these different um, approaches to eDNA-based methods, I give you here just kind of an overview of what I would like to call like the patchwork quilt of eDNA method standardization. And we now have dozens and dozens of these eDNA standardized methods or best practices from a number of different agencies um, and even work groups, um, both here in the US and abroad. And so again, this lack of coordination in developing these standardized protocols and best practices means that we have limited comparability of data sets. We've missed some really key opportunities to leverage economies of scale. Um, and we've also resulted in this confusing landscape of what exactly the best approach is. Time and time again, I have folks coming to us and saying, you know, we really want to start an eDNA survey, but we don't know where to begin. There's so many conflicting different uh, pieces of advice about how best to collect my sample or analyze my sample. And so I really credit this patchwork landscape um, and lack of method standardization as being one of the reasons that we've seen a slow uptake of these eDNA methods at large. Okay, so how can we uh, overcome uh, this lack of coordination? One of the big ideas that was proposed during the second national workshop on marine eDNA that happened here at SCORP last September um, was the development of what we're calling the national eDNA strategy for the United States. And so this would really be a call to all the federal agencies um, within the U.S. to come together and say that we need better coordination on eDNA method development, and there really needs to be a centralized body that's helping to orchestrate that and agreed upon national strategy that helps provide the framework for how we might be coordinating and collaborating on eDNA method uh, development and then implementation. We published uh, this idea in a special issue of Environmental DNA Journal. And then the idea was further picked up by the White House Office of Science Technology Policy, who established an eDNA task team to go forth with this charge of developing a national strategy for aquatic environmental DNA. And so it's pretty exciting that just a year ago, I think at COBW up in Sacramento, I was talking about how we were calling for this national eDNA strategy. And now here we are a year later and it's underway. And we have a draft that's been released by the Office of Science and Technology Policy um, right now. And it's out for federal agency review. Um, and so we're hopefully gonna see that come to life um, and be approved essentially or endorsed in about June of next year. I thought I'd give you a little bit of a sneak peek into some of the core components of the National Aquatic eDNA Strategy where it stands right now. Um, the key headline for the strategy is that it would be harnessing the power of eDNA to explore, map, monitor, and better understand aquatic life to sustain and restore biological resources into the future. So the key highlights here is that we're really using eDNA to help us better understand um, the biological communities in the US so that we can protect and restore them. Three of the ways that we would be doing that is through coordination and communication. So 
as um, we've highlighted here, integrating eDNA methods into decision making, um, helping to accelerate the adoption of these eDNA methods for informing management actions, building the capacity infrastructure and the research enterprise needed to employ eDNA technology at large scale. So if we're going to see an acceleration in eDNA method development, we need to have the tools and the labs and the training and the resources in order to support that. And then also this big goal of characterizing aquatic life in U.S. waters, which is no small feat, um, but it also goes in alignment with a lot of the current administration's goals on bio uh, monitoring across the U.S., the 30 by 30 initiative, the America the Beautiful, and other um, calls to better understand biological communities and aquatic life across the U.S. So I think it's important to kind of reflect on what this national strategy would mean for California and some of the three main highlights that I see is that having a uh, nationally recognized series of standards and best practices would really benefit any eDNA method development and implementation here in California. It would help us to improve harmonization of DNA-based data across numerous uh, monitoring programs. And then also it would help us build capacity to collect and analyze eDNA data. I think there's a really energetic user base or um, novice users who are interested in using eDNA-based tools. And sometimes the limitations are access to labs or access to analytical capacity. And so the national strategy would be prioritizing the development of DNA reference libraries and doing that in a coordinated fashion across the U.S. Um, in investing in commercial labs, like we'll be hearing um, from Genedex next um, for DNA sequencing or other analytical analyses. And then also in the development for automated platforms for eDNA method collection. This is something that's really neat um, that I think we're going to see increasingly coming online where we have some of these automated samplers that can be deployed off the end of a dock or off of a ship and be collecting um, with greater spatial and temporal um, consistency a number of these eDNA samples, again, to help us uh, better understand uh, biological communities across U.S. aquatic waters, and then also changes in those biological communities across space and time. To give you just a brief overview of what the timeline looks like for the developments of this strategy, as I said, we kind of kicked things off last year with the second national workshop on marine eDNA. We published a framework for that national strategy um, in early of this year. We announced the draft of the national strategy this past summer at the Capitol Hill Ocean Week. There's currently a draft out of this national aquatic eDNA strategy, and there's a public comment period open right now, which I'll talk about on the next slide. The goal, if the national strategy gets approved or endorsed, is that we can announce it at the third national workshop on marine eDNA, which is happening at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab next June. And then after the strategy kind of gets adopted, um, then they begin developing what's called the implementation plan. So the strategy is kind of like the short abridged version that highlights the key goals. The implementation plan is actually how those goals get realized and how the different federal agencies will be pitching in to make it come to life. Um, so the key way that you can get involved is right now. Um, there's a request for information open, which is the public comment period. Um, and all public comments submitted to this request for information are due at the end of this month. So that this is very time relevant. Um, one of the main reasons that you would want to submit a response to this national strategy RFI is that it really gives you know the people a voice on the development of national strategies. Um, it helps uh, different agencies or organizations uh, inform decision-making, shape policy, foster collaboration and partnerships. Um, all of these different responses to the RFI get collated by the authors of the strategy. They get individually responded to. And then when the authors go on to make that implementation plan, they actually look for areas of collaboration among the folks who had done the response, uh, had filled out the responses. Um, and then they try to bring those teams together for future development into the implementation plan. So by and large, the more responses a strategy gets, the better. It helps highlight the importance of um, the issue at hand. And so if anybody's interested in submitting a response to the RFI, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to um, send you some of these links and help you get set up to do that. Um, okay, and one of the last things that I wanted to comment here is that California's voice really matters in how this national strategy comes together. And that's because by and large, California is seen as a leader in the development of eDNA methods and standardization. A lot of that has to do with the people in this room. Um, and in 2018, um, a number of us had formed the California Molecular Methods Work Group, which is a work group within the California Water Quality Monitoring Council. And the goals of our work group really parallel the goals of the national strategy. We are focused on consensus building, so we bring together a really diverse community of researchers and eDNA uh, users, novices, stakeholders, um, state agencies, academics. It's really broad. Everyone's invited. Um, and we talk about um, 
the best ways of sampling or analyzing your eDNA samples, what's the latest research being done on eDNA method developments. We've created sampling and data reporting best practice guidelines that are available to download and have been now used to inform the development of standard protocols for a number of different monitoring programs in California. We also do a lot of informational webinars. We have one ongoing right now that's an eDNA 101 series that we've been doing in collaboration with the Collaboration Network. Um, and so that's been really great. We have another one coming up later this month. And then we're also focused on coordination and collaboration. So we have monthly meetings where we talk about everything going on in eDNA research. Um, and we've also had a number of research collaborations that have come out of our group interaction. So that's something I'm really proud of. And so I encourage anybody to reach out and you're welcome to join these conversations as well. So with that, I just wanted to end on saying that eDNA methods are clearly growing in popularity. Um, the eDNA national strategy is gonna help us accelerate their development and adoption. National coordination on method development will help provide consistent quality control and interpretation guidelines. And California has really been pointed to as a leader in eDNA method coordination. And it's really thanks to the bioassessment community and the folks in this room who have been employing these eDNA methods at the pilot scale, um, testing them out in their monitoring programs, giving us feedback, developing things like the SWAMP eDNA monitoring program, um, and really <clears throat> having these eDNA methods being deployed at scale has helped really involve, um, inform the development of these standardized protocols um, and optimization of the methods. So with that, I would say thank you so much. And if you're interested in our next webinar, um, you can find the link here and join us on November 16th for our eDNA webinar on species surveillance. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much. Go for it. Yeah, thank you. Great presentation and congratulations for getting this in national initiative set in place. This is really cool. I'm curious as um, to like setting these guidelines for each state, because I guess if we're looking at California versus North Dakota, those probably have very different environments. And I'm, I'm not sure how that would work, but maybe the fates of those eDNAs are also different in those states. So would you have different guidelines for how to like manage that the eDNA to like kind of maximize the fate or... How would that work? Yeah, great. That's such a great question. We talk a lot about how there's no one size fits all standardized protocol for eDNA for all the reasons that you um, pointed to. Usually you're um, customizing your eDNA protocol based on some characteristics of your environment or the research question that you're trying to answer. And I actually, I think I have a slide here on how we're trying to be um, like conceptualizing the idea of different types of standard protocols for different uses. And so you can have what we would call like guidelines or best practices that can be really general and apply to a broad range of different types of monitoring questions. And then you can have really specific standards that might be really highly customized to a particular research question or organism that you're studying or environment. And so your degree of flexibility of how you Think about how those different types of protocols can range um, from high to low and your permissible risk. So maybe you're using some best practice guidelines that everyone can kind of tweak to their needs versus standards you're using when there's really strict requirements that something has to be followed to a T um, and is maybe accompanied by a lab accreditation procedure and proficiency testing. And so the different kinds of levels of stringency of a protocol and how that has to be customized to fit, um, to be fit for purpose for the different types of monitoring questions that are being asked. Good question. Yes. Anybody else? One more question? Good. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Perfect. Good. Okay, so then it's going to be my pleasure to introduce Greg Schumer from Genedax, who's going to tell us about harmonizing eDNA practices for effective aquatic species monitoring and resource management. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Susie. That was a good short course on how to get like eight years of work into 15 minutes. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go for 13 years, actually, is what I'm going to do. Where's the clicker? This is the clicker. Okay. Um, I'm Greg. Hi. I'm a molecular biologist uh, with Kramer Fish Sciences. Uh, we started genetics in 2008. I'm, I'm not a fish ecologist or a, 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 an animal biologist. I work with Scott Blankenship, who's a population geneticist. Uh, we've been doing using eDNA surveys since 08. 
09, I think our first project, we actually packed water down from high Alpine lakes in Oregon in milk jugs on the backs of pack mules. And then we mailed it to UC Davis and I would filter stuff. And so I'm like a grandpa when it comes to eDNA. Um, we, we are a commercial lab. Uh, we've been, like I said, we've been doing this for 15 years and what we've noticed, and we, we work primarily on the on inland freshwater and not so much on coastal. I know you guys are very coastal down here. Um, we do have some uh, uh, saltwater habitat that we do monitor for certain people and some of it's down in Southern California. But what we've noticed with the groups and the agencies and the 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 different commercial enterprises that have come and gone and the, the academics that have come and gone, that everybody kind of goes through their phases of eDNA. The whole field is kind of going through this, this arc where everybody gets really, really excited they think they're just going to go find everything that's out there. Uh, then you realize that it does have some limitations. You get a little skeptical and then, you know, everybody kind of plummets down through denial, anger and depression. And then eventually, you know, you end up over at bargaining. You're like, okay, I can do this. I'm still going to be able to snorkel. I can still scuba dive. It's not going to take away all the field work. You can actually do this. And then it seems like, you know, most of the agency folks and a lot of people are getting over here into bargaining and acceptance. There's some siloed places that are still in denial and anger <laughs> and depression. So um, but really the standardization and the harmonization and getting people to have a better understanding of what's going on in the field kind of helps people get through this arc. So efforts uh, like the molecular methods work group, there's a bunch of other things that you can tend. It really helps people understand what's going on and move their way through this arc over to acceptance because acceptance is where we all get to work together and find funding and do great science. Uh, and we've existed in this, um, this kind of nebulous environment in the Western United States where everything is dammed and all the water is controlled. It's all engineered to go towards the people. Mostly there's some of it's for the biology, but most of it's for the people. Uh, and, and to exist in this environment, you have the regulators, so all the federal, state, local agencies that regulate access to the water. I'm sure you guys all know this. Then you have the people who want the water, so water districts, uh, Disneyland. Uh, by us, it's farmers. There's a lot of people who want that water, and they need to get a permit to get that water, and then they need to measure their impact on that that natural resource. If they want more of it, they have to measure their impact on the endangered species. Are they introducing uh, non-natives? Are they are they introducing invasive so you have to measure these effects so they take a bunch of actions to get their permit and then they have to prove their compliance with these permits and they have to measure these actions somehow is are there more salmon are there more delta smelt are there more tidewater goby are there more endangered species are things showing up that you wanted to show up are things not showing up are, are there things showing up that you didn't know about so you need to be able to do these things which is oh. Led to some issues in a lot of in a lot of places for a lot of species. You can't measure it, or you can't get a permit to measure it. So you can you can be a land banker, and you can spend tens of millions of dollars on creating habitat, and you can't get a permit from the state or federal government to go observe if the species that are supposed to be coming there are actually supposed to be there. So in a lot of cases, this is a disconnect. So there's this loop needs to keep happening. You need to get a permit to, to access the aquatic resources and you need to tell people what your impact is on that aquatic resource. And then you go back and get a permit. And this goes around and around and around. And that's kind of how the water has moved around the Western United States. So if you want water, you've got to get permission to do it. You want permission, you got to prove that what you're doing isn't just killing everything that's involved. Uh, which leads to compliance. So you can mitigate, you can restore, you can engage the public. And at some level, this all includes some biological monitoring. As I just mentioned, you need to you need to tell people what you're doing to the salmon or the delta smelt or the tidewater goby or whatever endangered species happens to be in your region to, to keep that permit going, right? Or is it invasive? We do a lot of work with invasives in the Central Valley because it, it's the most invaded estuary on the planet there's an invasive species coming in there every day it seems like they might as well just start like a little uh like a customs agent or something yeah, and just let people let new species come in uh so you have a choice if you're going to monitor the biology you have this choice you can you can use the 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 existing protocol so you can maintain the status quo 
or in a lot of instances, you need to scale up. So when you when these permits are renewed, you need to. It's it's. I've read it through the US EPA, through a couple of other federal agencies. If you you need to make more observations more often, that's the message that's coming out. If you want your permit or you want extended access to the resource natural resources, you need to look at what you're doing more often, which means scaling. You got to you have to scale up. You have to hire more people. You have to spend more money. You have to do this stuff. So you can absorb that cost. A lot of people absorb it because it's the price for doing business to move water from Shasta to Los Angeles, right? That's the price. So they absorb that cost because they make a lot of money. Or some people have no choice. They have to adapt. They have to change the way that the biology is monitored in order to renegotiate their permit because it doesn't make any sense to maintain the status quo or just absorb. These are the folks that we end up working with, right? Either the protocol is out of date, it doesn't work, or you can't get it. Right. Sometimes you can't. We've worked with people that are forced to monitor the biology by the federal or state government, but they can't get a permit to monitor the biology. So it's it's a catch twenty two. Right. They can't get their permit, or they can't get to set their construction schedules, or whatever it is. You want to fix a piling on the coast on Highway One. You want to put a storm drain in somewhere. You want to do all these things that we expect as a society to maintain the infrastructure, but they're in this stuck in this this loop, right? Like you can't get the permit to do the construction. So how do you monitor that? So that's if, if proof of compliance is not possible, they're out of compliance. It's 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 sticky. This this ends up being our client, the people that that aren't absorbing the impact, absorbing the costs, and and increasing their programs tenfold. They're not maintaining the status quo because maybe there is no onus to, to monitor the biology for whatever permit they're getting. And in a lot of cases, the permits don't include biological monitoring. Some cases, excuse me. The biology isn't always the, the most important thing. It's Does the water get to where it needs to go? Is it reliable? And is it sufficient enough for the people at the other end, right? That's And then biology is like fifth or sixth, right? Uh, so what we have found working with the clients is that they're they're genuinely interested in solutions, right? They want to give the regulator what they are asking for if they can produce it. So they get a more reliable water source. The regulator issues the permit. They're, the, it's better for the species if, if they know what they're supposed to be monitoring and which species they're supposed to be monitoring and how to make their restoration or their mitigation more impactful to the species, right? So this goes around and around and around. But if you can't do that, you, you kind of just hand out water and then people mitigate. They spend billions of dollars mitigating instead of actually saving the species. So what we found is that this, this can go on for a while. Uh, and if you don't ask the regulator and the regulated what questions they're trying to answer or what decisions they're trying to make up front, you can get stuck in this technical spiral where, where you've got a bunch of people out there doing eDNA, thousands of people out there doing eDNA, all with different protocols, as Susie pointed out, right? You have all these disparate efforts going on. You, this guy's using this filter with this pump and extracts with this kit and analyzes in this way. And you have thousands of people out searching for solutions without knowing what the problems are or what the questions are. So you get this. You get what we have right now. You have thousands of people doing eDNA. And they're, and they're just like proposing solutions. And then the federal government is like, no, not that one, not that one, not that one. Or the state, right? Like not, the, so it really helps to, um, uh, to figure out what they need. What do people need? What species do they need to find? What level of sensitivity do they need? What probability of detection do they have to have in order to incorporate this in some sort of permit discussion? And what we find is that this this does not happen a lot of the times. What we do is we get when we engage the regulators, you get into a discussion that's like, well, what do you need? And the reply is usually, well, what can you give us? And then we get to keep going, what do you need? Well, what can you give us? What kind of information can you get? What do you need to get into the well, how sensitive is it? And you end up in this technical spiral. Uh, so what you net, really what we do is we try to measure the effectiveness of any protocol or anybody else's protocol so that we can when we go into a situation, we can say, you should be using this protocol versus that protocol or this filter versus that filter. The only way you do that that we have found is to measure the effect protocol has on your probability of detecting molecules in the aquatic environment. If you don't do that, then you're just kind of like, well, I did it five times and I found it 
four out of five times. And this person did it eight times and they found it seven out of eight times. So which protocol do we use? Well, if you're not measuring the effect your protocol has on the probability of detection, you're kind of, it's, it's, it's very qualitative and it's kind of who can yell the loudest in the room sometimes. Uh, so this is, this is something that we developed. It's, it's free. Anybody can download this. We take agreed upon, agreed upon protocol. We measure the effect it has on our probability of detecting the target organism. We usually use positive controls, which I can't say enough, like put positive controls out there so that you can calibrate whatever protocol you're using. If there's anybody out there, you're aspiring graduate students or government folks that are looking for projects, we really need a positive control that works in the environment and that everybody can use so we can get to this place that Susie was talking about where everybody kind of agrees on a standardization of protocol, right? And we can set these different levels, but if you can't measure the effect of your protocol, you can't do that. So we put positive controls in, we see how it affects our probability of detection. We go back to the regulator and say, we have an 80% probability of detecting this thing. Are you okay with that? And they say, well, yes or no, or Right. And then we go back with the regulator and the regulator, and we engage in that conversation. Then we just keep going around and around and around. But Artemis is just an R package that you can download off, off a website and it'll, and it's agnostic to the protocol. It doesn't care what variable you put in there. Okay. It doesn't matter the filter type. It doesn't matter what your, if you have a backpack sampler or a screw gun or a peristaltic pipe, it doesn't matter. Right. What, what it's doing is it's calculating the effect the different variables have on your probability of detection. So the only thing you need is a standard curve from a qPCR assay. And it will take all these variables, calculate it, and it'll tell you the effect it has on the concentration of the molecules, right? So you can just kind of, you can game this whole thing in advance and say, I want an 80% probability detection. How much water do I need to take and how many filters do I need to replicate in the, in the field and how many technical replicates do I need in the lab and anything else? What's the temperature? What's the pH? What's turbidity? What's all this stuff? And you can just game this, and then you go out into the field and actually use it. <clears throat> okay, that was my pitch for for that kind of standardization. Uh, so now I'll go into some examples. How much time do I have, by the way? I'm good? I have five minutes? Right, to 15 or to 20? Oh, wow, I didn't even practice this, you guys. I'm, my game is on this morning. Um, so I have five minutes. So just a couple of examples of, of where and how and with whom we've used this. Um, this is an ongoing project in downtown Stockton, lovely tropical Stockton. If you've never been there, I, I would suggest going to see a hockey game there. It's very fun. This is the San Joaquin River. Also lovely. Um, this is a uh, floodplain upgrade. So these are really rich people and these are not. <laughs> This was like we sampled up here and it was like the heart of darkness. I'm not kidding you. It when we, we were here, like, wow, I you know, I could land my helicopter here. And by the time we got there, our prop had a sleeping bag wrapped around it. There was shopping carts in the way. It was just it was it was really gnarly. Like it was amazing. Anyway, so there, you know, you gotta save the golf courses. So they put up this uh <laughs> This wall that's going to go up and down with the height of the water, and you can drive your boats over. It's super cool. But this is this is Delta smelt habitat, one of the most protected species in California. Right? You can't just go in here and do this. So they the the I think it was U.S. Fish and California Department of Fish and Wildlife told the this this is our um, Army Corps told the Army Corps if they wanted a construction permit. They needed to monitor this before, during, and after construction. And, oh, by the way, their, their take limit was one delta smell for the entire project, five-year project, four-year project. And they so they couldn't approve the, um, the netting. They were going to do like sane nets, I think, or purse, whatever. They were going to net the canal. They are going to net this whole thing out in front and over there to count the fish. So... The monitoring strategy they recommended broke their own permit restrictions. So it was a catch-22 for everybody. So they couldn't perform the mon they couldn't get the permit to perform the monitoring in the way that was dictated by the state and the federal government under the uh, Section 7 or the ESA, whatever it was. So we went in to negotiate with them and said, okay, look, this is how we'll do we'll do DDNA transacts over here. Da, da, da. This is our probability of detection. This is how many passes we need to make to make an equivalency of your netting strategy. And they agreed. 
So after a few meetings with CDFW and um, U.S. Fish or NIMS, I can't remember who it was, they agreed to write the protocol in and they changed the language, the wording of take. I don't know if you guys have ever seen these permits, but it's in quote, like take is in big quotes. So take in this case was not physical take, it was molecular. And if we got an actual detection, they agreed to reconsult and up the take by one. So it was a perpetual increase of take by one. So if we found a molecule, they're like, okay, we'll give you, your take is now two. If you find another, okay, now your take is three. So anyway, we're in year four of that. Um, we're going back out pretty soon to do the posts. They're almost done. Uh, so that's one case. The second case is a water district in middle southern, middle California. They have a, this is a water district that's engaged with the state and federal government. Again, I believe this is section seven. This is Endangered Species Act. <clears throat> The regulator wants to reintroduce two endangered species onto the water district property. However, this property borders a lot of residential areas, right? So, if, and if you have a, many of you may know this, if you have a endangered species on your property, you all of a sudden own critical habitat. And it could not be your property very long uh, because the federal government can take it occasionally. They don't do that all the time. Don't only Nevada. Do you guys remember the frog in Nevada when they took the whole town? The Royal, what was that? The Royal Toad? The Royal Toad in Beatty, Nevada. It's an interesting story. They have the only habitat for this toad and they grabbed the hole. They took it, but the town took it back. Um, so again, you have these choices that we've been talking about. They have to monitor the biology, but they're reintroducing these species. So what do you, what do they do? Do they just scale up their program tenfold everywhere to look for red-legged frog or um, California tiger salamander? Or do they come up with a way to make more up observations more often without upping their budget tenfold. So they've decided to adapt or change the protocol, but which means we have to go into negotiation with the state and federal government again. And you can see there's, there's private area that borders their property. So if you're, and that's positive, if your red-legged frog goes over to this guy's farm, all of a sudden his farm is critical habitat. So they're, the water district is concerned about getting sued by landowners the federal government needs to protect the species they wanted to have a reintroduction part like everybody wants the species to work and the species to recover but how do you do that meaningfully so you don't you know jeopardize the water district from from its responsibility to deliver water and the federal government needs to adhere to the permit so how do you do that so we're going into negotiations over this as well to find tiger salamander so the first step was to go out and just Make sure that you can use eDNA uh, in an equivalent manner as the seining. Uh, you guys may know this. They walk through the water with uh, two people with the seine. I had never seen this before. So they just drag the whole pond and if there's a frog in it. That's positive. Same with the tiger salamander. Or they put out these adorable little fences. I don't know if you guys have seen that around the water. And then there's a gate in it. And then when the tiger salamander follows the fence around, because it's trapped, it falls in a bucket. And then they walk up and they're like, yep, there's a tiger salamander here. So that's an, those are old protocol that they just don't want to do because they have 137 ponds. So they can't put a little tiny fence around everything. I'm way over now, right? We're still good. So we found the positive and one at their negative. So they went back out and reevaluated. Now we need to go in and say, okay, here's a to the federal government, like here's how we're proposing to to monitor 137 ponds in perpetuity, but we need some sort of ground rules. Like if it's negative this many times for this many years, then you can reduce the amount of observation. Da, da, da. So we need to figure out what they need to to get this data into a regulatory context, right? So you have to talk. So that's very important. Or you end up just kind of going out and being like, we took five filters at this pond and didn't find anything. And they're like, okay. Uh. So anyway, talking is very important. So the take home message is if the goal is to create all this collaboration between all these different entities, knowing which questions you're trying to answer really helps. Or you can come up with a solution that doesn't answer anything or it's it needs a problem knowing what decisions need to be made in the in a de structured decision making process or it's or a regulatory context is really important uh, especially when these well, we're at this point where there's national strategies and international strategies like it's moving down that way edna has come a long way in a decade um we're going to need what 
we're going to need to know this. And, and knowing both of these will just speed up the whole process, really. So that, that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Questions for Greg? Hi, Lee. Um, I had a question about the Artemis R package. Um, you said it basically just needs a QPCR standard curve. Um, would it be able to be applied to something like digital PCR, which doesn't have a standard core curve, or uh, meta barcoding? Right now, it functions on, on the standard curve for the assay. So what we do, if we're doing another type of analysis in the field like metabarcoding or digital PCR, we put the positive control and we calibrate using qPCR. In the, we go back into the Artemis program. We're like, okay, how far away do we need to be? What volume do we need to take? How many filters do we need to take at 200 meters to detect this much biomass? And what's our probability of detection? And then we apply that to a metabarcoding analysis or a digital PCR. So we can, uh, we, but right now it's dependent on the qPCR, that the the standard curve equation. Time for one more question. Good, I have one. Um, so I love this idea of knowing what decisions need to be made, and so I'm wondering if you see like variation in the probability of detection that people are comfortable with, depending on what type of decision. So are some people okay with 50%? Or does everyone say, no, I need 95% probability of detection? Well, everybody wants it to be 100%, right? They're like, well, okay, you want it to be 100%, which we can't do. It, it asymptotes. Your probability of detection is always going to asymptote and never reach 100. Nothing's perfect. Can't do that. Uh, so what we do is we, when we get into this situation, we ask them what they're currently doing. So we look at their current protocol. Um, in some cases, like with uh, red surveys up north where you have reds, red identification in a stretch that has multiple species in it the the so they're they're all there at the same time but there's two or three species in the river i didn't i didn't know this happened either uh their their rate of detection is seven to twelve percent right so they're comfortable right now with the 90 let's say a 90 percent uncertainty so we're gonna like okay here's our protocol and the way we see it now we're 50 it's a coin toss so we kind of we gauge where they're at. We gauge what we can provide. And so we manage those expectations up front. So we're not telling people you have a 90 breed, right? Like we have to get there and say, and that's the conversation. But people want as high as possible, but there's budget. Like, so you have all these, that's the other thing in Artemis we always want to put in is like money. How much, how much, prob what, pro how high can you get your probability with $20,000 budget? So. Awesome. Great. All right. Round of applause for Greg. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right, we're going to go to our next speaker, who is Nastasia Patton, and she is joining us from Noah Cal Coffee and Squirp. Thanks for leading the way on the uh, black background slides. We've eased people into those. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, my name is Nastasia Patton, and I'm a project scientist with. Squirp and also with Cal Coffee, which um, hopefully many of you are familiar with, but if not, oh, thank you. If not, I'll give you a little intro um, in my talk. And I'm gonna be talking today about how we are working with both of the programs to move some of the goals that Susie has talked about today um, forward at a regional level, at a national level, and even at an international level. And so um, we're really excited about eDNA and we're trying to um, make the most of it in our, our biodiversity surveys and our ecological um, understandings. So I wanted to start with this image, um, which I like for two main reasons. Um, number one is that some of you may know there was a big marine heat wave in 2014, 2015 that really affected our temperatures here on the West Coast. But even a few years after that officially ended, temperatures have remained elevated on the coast. Um, we are really experiencing these kind of persistent environmental changes. And it's really important that we are able to monitor those changes and understand what they mean for our biology. And the second reason is that I think this really shows how the effects can be 
both regional. So we have very, very localized um, effects like here in Southern California or in the San Francisco Bay. And then, um, you know, those can be different from the overall regional effects. So we're not seeing elevated temperatures along the entire coast, but we have to be able to understand both the very localized effects as well as their implications for the regional um, uh, California current uh, ecosystem and, and beyond. And so um, today I'll be telling you about how Squirp and Cal Coffee are working together to bring a synergy to our monitoring programs and our eDNA approaches so that we can um, have an understanding not only of what's happening in our, our metaphorical backyard um, or maybe our physical backyard, if you're lucky, um, as well as uh, uh, for the entire um, West Coast of North America. And so, right, so just to emphasize this, drive this point home, you know, we're experiencing things that are um, now, you know, things that are now considered normal that were not considered normal a decade ago or five years ago. And these include not only elevated temperatures, but also um, oxygen depletion areas, um, red tides, things like this. And they're all interconnected. And um, we're hoping that eDNA is going to help us monitor those effects and um, predict changes in the future. So I want to uh, introduce my my other employer, uh, Cal Coffee, the California Cooperative Oceanic Fisheries Investigations. This is a very long running um, biological and ecological survey. Uh, it's been going for over 70 years and um, started off as a result of the fishery crashes um, in the 40s that really spurred this this need to um, understand what is happening um, in the oceans at a chemical level, at a physical level and at a biological level. And so today, Cal Coffee provides a lot of really valuable data um, to our marine manager and policymaker communities. That includes oceanographic data, more physical and chemical type parameters that I mentioned, as well as biological. Um, so they do marine mammal and seabird surveys. They count fish larval eggs. They do zooplankton toes. Um, and now we are starting to move into eDNA. And um, officially, eDNA collection began in 2014, so about, about almost 10 years ago, um, with the NOAA Cal Coffee Ocean Genomics Program. Um, but this was really designed for uh, microbiome analyses. So at the time, uh, we didn't call it eDNA, we just called it DNA, and we filtered water and we sequenced it for microbes. Um, and, and so that's the vast majority of the data that we have is microbial, microbially focused. Um, but there has been a publication out from that that has compiled this the start of this time series, and it it has you know shown some really interesting trends um, in the relationship between nutrients and different um, taxonomic groups that that were analyzed from those data. Um, and this is just a map showing some of the core Cal Coffee stations. Um, they don't go all the way up here uh, every survey on every survey, so twice a year they only they focus on Southern California, Southern California bite. Um, but you can see that, um, you know, over the course of 70 years, I've really um, managed to, to consistently collect an incredible um, breadth of oceanographic data in, um, off the coast of California. And so uh, bringing together Cal Coffee with its bite monitoring program, um, I'm sorry, Squirp with its bite monitoring program and Cal Coffee with its broader oceanographic monitoring program um, is really an amazing opportunity to come together and move forward some of these goals that Susie talked about, like harmonizing our methods, making sure we're using the same approaches to collect um, similar types of data so that we can generate interoperable data that can be compared with each other. We can make these apples to apples comparisons and we don't have to look at um, bite data from a year ago and say, oh, well, they found this thing, but you know, they use these primers. So we're not really sure if we can say the same thing for all Cal Coffee data. No, we want to be using the same primers. We want to be collecting water in a same or very similar way so that um, we can uh, compare our data and get a um, generate a bigger um, uh, and inter more interoperable data set. We want to move our analytical capabilities forward. So that's not just on the collection and the wet lab and the sequencing side, but also on the on the um, and the computational side. So I'll talk a little bit about efforts on that front. Um, and then we want to just expand our spatial and temporal reach of these surveys. So where we can combine our very focused bite um, program with the the broader California current. So just a few examples to highlight our efforts on these fronts. Um, the first is a method intercalibration experiment. This was performed uh, about a year ago in the Cal Coffee fall cruise of 2022. And we tested a bunch of different um, water filtering methods, different filters, um, processing types. And now we are um, generating sequence data from three different uh, gene, uh, marker genes, which represent 
different levels of the trophic food web. So, um, ooh, is that me? Sorry. Um, and so this has been uh, a big push on the on the processing and analytical side, and where we've generated some sequence data, but we're not quite ready to publish our results or show them to you yet, but they are coming soon. And we're really hopeful that this will provide the community a sense of, okay, you can rely on these, you know, one or more approaches will generate similar data, or you're not going to be missing out on some key species if you choose to use this type of filter. Um, hopefully the results will be similar enough, but also hopefully there will be some clear winners in terms of um, amount of DNA generated, um, diversity covered. Um, and so and so this will be just one more data point in our effort to provide the community with a set of data points on best practices. Mitogenome sequencing. So this is maybe a little bit in the weeds for some of you, but this touches on um, Susie's point about building DNA reference libraries. So right now we generate sequence data and then we have to compare that data to what exists in, in a, in a um, reference library that is publicly available. And those reference libraries are often sadly lacking. So a lot of key species that you would think would be in there have just never been sampled, sequenced, archived, published. Um, and so we might be, you know, getting some incredibly important species data and we don't know what it is because it just annotates as being unknown. And so um, we are performing these gap analyses that some of you may have heard uh, from our student Garrett yesterday. He was a part of that effort trying to understand what is missing from the databases and what needs still to be sequenced um, and added to these libraries so that we can be confident that when we do our surveys, we will um, be able to detect the presence or absence of all all the organisms that we're interested in. So yes, charismatic metacopana. Everyone is interested in whales and dolphins, um, but it turns out they are quite challenging to detect in the ocean. And so um, Cal Coffee has been the recipient of some funds from the um, uh, Office of Naval Research to improve our um, ability to detect um, largely cetaceans and pinnipeds, but also prey of these animals. So that includes fish and cephalopods. And um, as yeah, we're we're kind of in the early stages of that that project, um, and we're working together with some scientists at the University of Washington as well who are involved in that. Um, but some early uh, sequence data from Baja, California, actually was was pretty exciting. We were able to identify the um, Guadalupe fur seal, which I knew nothing about before this project, but apparently is very rare, uh, very endangered nearly extinct, um, but we did find some some DNA traces in our samples. And so um, that gives us hope that we can apply these methods to other similarly threatened or rare species um, in the mammal realm, which are always the most challenging ones. So I mentioned the computational side of things. We want to be pushing, you know, leading the way, not only on um, the lab work, the sequencing, but also on the analysis. Once you get your sequence data, what does it mean? What can it tell us um, about our communities? And so um, going beyond just taking one uh, sequence table and getting overview of a community at one level of the trophic web in one point in space and time. Um, we, myself and a, a team of, of my colleagues are um, writing a, a program to um, provide a modeling approach that we can take multiple different metabarcoding data sets and run them through a Bayesian um, uh, regression model to um, understand what are the drivers, what are the, the linkages between these different data sets, what are the taxa that are um, driving these linkages, and what can that tell us about how communities are interconnected and um, how they might change uh, in the future with the, the environmental perturbations that I mentioned. And so everything I talked about is sort of these more short-term immediate goals, these kind of um, punchy things that we're, we're working on uh, that, you know, will... will um, provide deliverables in the near future, but we're we're thinking long term, and we're trying to um, use these these short term goals to also advance our our longer term goals. And some of those, you know, we're thinking we're thinking big. So we're thinking about water quality, of course, but also ocean ocean acidification and hypoxia impacts at a local level, at a regional level, at a national level. Um, we're thinking about identifying and maybe even forecasting harmful algal blooms, um, identifying trophic drivers of fish assemblages. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, the um, distributions of protected species, rare, endangered species, and um, can we use our survey data um, that is reliable and comparable to um, provide the scale of information that we just haven't been able to, to generate um, thus far. And so 
uh, leading into this, this is, I've talked a lot about our Scorp Cal Coffee partnership and it's a really, it's a really strong one. It's really expanding our scope. I want to take it to even the next level and talk a little bit about the Ocean Biomolecular Observing Network. So the OBON is a UN decade, uh, sponsored program. So if you don't know, this is the UN Decade of Ocean Science, uh, and they have supported a, a few programs that are advancing goals of um, uh, uh, helping us observe and monitor the world's oceans. And so Oban is one of those. And um, we are a, a regional Oban within that, um, and we have called ourselves the West Coast Oban. And so we aim to be part of this global observing network that is coming together to agree on some of these best practices to generate these large scale data sets. Um, and we're going to be representing the, the North American West Coast arm of that. And so we're assembling uh, a team of partners. We're really excited about the folks that have joined our team so far. Scorp and Cal Coffee are, um, are leading the way along with um, PMEL, which is a, a NOAA lab up in Seattle. Um, but, but we have uh, partners up in Central California and Bari, um, Southern California Coastal Observing um, Network, um, CCELTER. Some of these acronyms may be familiar to you, maybe not. It doesn't really matter. The point is we're putting together um, a team of of partners that are all performing their own biodiversity surveys. So a lot of people are going out, they're collecting eDNA in their little region of interest, um, and they're generating some really exciting data, but it's all being siloed in-house. They're using it for some, you know, some small projects. Um, and we want to get out there and say, we should be coming together. We should be sharing um, data, sharing uh, um, experiences with with what works well, what doesn't, coming together on best practices, and hopefully generating a network of um, eDNA observations that will span the the spatial and temporal scales that we're we're, we're hoping. And right now, it is a little bit uh, Southern California focused, and we're hoping to um, to fill in some of these geographical gaps that we see up here and. Um, we're hopeful that we're going to, um, yeah, bring in some, reel in some new partners soon from Northern California and Oregon. Um, but also, I think I maybe forgot to mention the Hakai Institute um, up in Canada and British Columbia. And so we are technically an international uh, regional network right now, which is fantastic. And so just to, to sum up, I think... Um, all the things I've mentioned are in line with these, these bigger goals of understanding um, how our oceanographic conditions are changing, how they're affecting the biodiversity and the ecosystem dynamics in our area. And we think that eDNA is going to be a really important part of that. It is not, of course, the only uh, tool in the toolbox, but it's an important one. And it's a really exciting time for the field as we see sequencing costs drop, as we see expertise increase um, and people you know, excited about these methods and moving them forward and just some amazing science that is happening in the academic realm, in the government realm, in the private sector. Um, I think we're really at an inflection point for, for eDNA and ecosystem monitoring. And it's really exciting that Scorp and Cal Coffee are, are at the forefront of that. So I think that was my last slide and I'm probably a little short, but that's okay. I'll take any questions. Great. Thank you, Nastasia. Questions? Lindsay. Um, thank you. That was an awesome presentation. Um, and I was curious about the study that you were mentioning where you guys are developing a program for doing more multi-trophic level approaches to these types of analyses. Um, that data were the different taxa that you were analyzing, were they were those, you know, samples that you collected that you were looking at multiple analytes? Like were you multiplexing um within like the same sample that was collected on the same time, same day? Um, or were these multiple studies that you were kind of compiling together? And um, how are you comparing um, the data with these? We've, we were actually talking about this earlier in the day, um, you know, the types of um, variation that you could see like spatially and temporally between taxonomic groups could vary pretty widely. So I'm just curious your thoughts on that and like what you guys have been doing there. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. I'm really excited about um, about that program. And so, for 
when we started it, the vision was we have um, a set of eDNA samples that where the DNA was um, sent for sequencing and for different markers. So we would take one, one eDNA sample and we would submit it for 12S, for 18S, for CO1, for 16S sequencing. And so now we have these metabar coding data sets that all provide different levels of taxonomy um, taxonomic information and but they come from the same sample and so together in theory we should be able to be we should be able to build like a you know kind of holistic um picture of the community but in practice there's not a good way to to link those right you kind of you still look at them individually and you still say well we see these microbes and these fish and you know we don't really know what's linking them and so the idea with mambo was to run them through this Bayesian regression model so you could pick out the most important features from each data set that are consistently related to other important features in the other data set. Now we chose to do that with um, different meta different marker genes from the same sample, but you could totally do it in a different way. You could take the same marker gene and apply it to different um, time scales or time points. Um, you could, or a different um, uh, place a different spatial point. So it's really, it's agnostic, I think, to the comparison um, data sets that you're using. It just depends on your question and what you're trying to link um, and how you want to, um, yeah, what important features are you trying to to pull out? And so, um, yeah, I hope that answered your question, but we can talk about it afterwards more if you want. Love to, yeah. Great. I believe you said you that this has been going on for 10 years or more? There has been eDNA collected on Cal Coffee on and off for about 10 years. How, how are you guys storing your DNA? Yeah, great question. So the NCOG program, um, the NCOG program is a partnership with an academic lab um, at SIO and, and the J. Craig Venter Institute. And they have been, they have taken charge of that filtration, sampling and storage um, this whole time for, for NCOG specifically. Um, you know, these are small filters, so they, they don't take up a ton of space individually, but yes, over the course of 10 years, um, they do add up and we have been informed many times that, uh, freezer space is a limitation and we need to be thinking about how we plan to deal with that in the future. So, um, it's something that's on our minds and, uh, I don't have a good answer for you in terms of the future, but right now it's, yeah, we're being helped out by, um, the Allen lab at JCBI. And any online? Okay, great. I had one last question. So in an ideal world, you know, maybe five years from now, we've all aligned how we're sampling and analyzing the eDNA samples um, or collecting and analyzing the eDNA samples. What do we have currently about frameworks for how that data is reported um, and then shared? Can you speak to standardization on metadata reporting? <laughs> Yes, I certainly can. Uh, that's a big part of our Oban and, and our, you know, Scorecal Coffee partnership. Um, it's a little bit boring, so I chose not to put it in the presentation, but we are actively working on it. And so um, I would say we're working very closely with a, a group at NOAA um, in OAR that has is really forging the way and being real martyrs in this um, field of helping us develop templates and scripts for us to upload data to some public repositories of biodiversity information. So namely um, GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information something. Yeah. Uh, and OBIS, which is like the ocean arm um, of GBIF. And so um, federal agencies, NOAA, USGS are all moving towards depositing their biodiversity data on those um, those portals. The problem is they're not designed for eDNA. They're designed for like going out and counting birds and uploading your table of bird counts. And so we are, um, yeah, actively working with the folks in NOAA omics, um, and other groups that are trying to develop some more streamlined ways of converting like ASV or taxon tables, which we get from eDNA into OBIS and GBIF friendly formats. And the goal is that all of our data will be in those portals and those databases and will be available and linked to specific projects as well. So you can search by project or by region and find eDNA information on those portals. And um, yeah, it's a really critical part of, of our program. And um, it's just not my personal favorite part. <laughs> And now we're going to move on to our last speaker, who is Sarah Stinson, joining us from Department of Water Resources. And here we are. Thank you so much, Sarah. 
put this down, I guess. All right, thanks, Susie, and thank you to the other organizers uh, for having me here. And um, thank you for everyone who stuck around for the very bitter end um, for the last talk. Thanks for being here. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Department of Water Resources implementation of eDNA monitoring. And even though my name is here, I'm Sarah Stinson, hi, by the way. Um, even though my name is on this slide, this is the work of a lot of different individuals within the department and also collaborations with other agencies and um, universities and private entities. And so I just wanna acknowledge that this is not just uh, my work that I'll be presenting. And I'm gonna give you an overview first of some of the the uh, larger context that this work fits into. And then I'll be showing you some project highlights of individual projects that we are currently working on. Um, so if you didn't already know that there was a push for creating a national eDNA strategy, I hope you learned it uh, from Susie's talk earlier. Um, but I'll just reiterate that that is something that is coming to a head now. It's very exciting. It's a very exciting time to be doing eDNA research um, and for all the reasons that Susie mentioned, it's also important for us to think about how our individual work fits into this larger context. So for DWR, our interest in this um, specifically is to um, provide transparency for what the agency is doing and also inform our managers, our resource managers, on how to appropriately apply these tools. Um, DWR uh, staff have been involved in several documents that have uh, come out of this effort, and some of them are, are listed here, but um, there are others as well. Um, so stemming from that larger national strategy, DWR is in the process of developing our own eDNA strategy for the department. And this is currently a draft that is near completion and should be ready soon, I've been told. I'm not going to go through this whole slide in the interest of time and that it's very close to the lunch hour. Um, but I just want to point out that um, some of the goals that we want to come out of this are both executive and technical work groups for eDNA research within DWR, and that um, there are many external um, uh, values or perspectives that we take into consideration and internal value that we hope to gain from developing this strategy. So hopefully that'll be ready and available soon for anyone who's interested in um, using it to inform their own strategies. So why is it important for us to develop um, our monitoring program at DWR? There are many reasons that we're interested in pursuing this, including um, continued operation of state water project uh, and also uh, meeting our regulatory mandates, which are two high priority items for DWR, but also other incentives as well. Um, embracing new technologies and being able to rapidly make decisions and inform our resource managers DWR has identified several uh, applications that we are currently or hoping to Im imply import in the future, um, including rare species monitoring and uh, invasive species monitoring, nuisance species such as harmful algal blooms. Um, and we are using biodiversity and climate change here as representing our habitat restoration projects. So how will climate change affect those efforts and how are we monitoring biodiversity at those restoration sites as well as pathogen monitoring? So these are all high priority. This is not a comprehensive list, but these are some of the areas of research that we're hoping to implement eDNA monitoring in. Uh, and now the fun part, I get to highlight some uh, of the wonderful projects that are currently underway or in the pilot phase within DWR. And uh, the, the individuals pictured here are, I'm a little biased. These are all people within my group that I work with in the Collaborative Ecological Studies Unit. Um, sorry, Greg, I didn't have a great picture of you to add in there, but, uh, <laughs> but I'll, be, I'll be talking about collaborations with other groups as well. Um, but, um, and this is not a comprehensive list, as I mentioned, and some of these projects I was not directly involved in doing the field work, so I'll do my best to go through them. If you have questions after that I can't answer, I'd be happy to connect you with the people who did that work. 
Um, the first project I was very involved in, uh, which is doing larval entrainment monitoring at Clifton Court Four Bay, which is at the south end of the San Francisco Bay Delta at the very beginning of the California aqueduct. So when smelt enter this area of the South Delta, they can become entrained, meaning they cannot escape and they are at risk of being impacted by the state water project operations there. And so obviously we want to minimize the impact to these species as best we can. And minimizing the impact also means knowing where they are and how they might be affected. So there's currently um, monitoring efforts and salvage efforts. However, these salvage efforts are not in place for larval smelt. So larval smelts that are under 20 millimeters in length are not very well characterized by these monitoring efforts. So we don't really know what's going on with them or how they might be impacted by um, operations there. And so our goal, um, multiple, our overall goal for multiple projects was to be able to get a better sense of are these larval fish being uh, entrained? Are they being affected by state water project operations? So I'll talk about a few different projects related to that study, including a larval preservation study, and then um, some, some field studies that we did this last year. For the larval preservation study, we examined seven different preservative types with the goal of being able to both morphologically identify the larval fish that we collected at these um, salvage collection events and also be able to extract DNA both from tissue for uh, parentage analysis to know are these smelt wild smelt, are they coming from, um, from, from our FCCL facility there? Um, and also to be able to potentially detect the DNA from the preservative to prioritize which samples might contain rare species for analysis. If you've ever done morphological ID, you know it takes a long time and um, there are quite a few number of samples that the staff have to go through and do these IDs on and they have a limited number of staff to do these identifications. And so being able to go through your samples and get a sense of which might contain an endangered or threatened species would be really helpful because they can prioritize those morphological identifications and confirmations. So um, on the top is on the top left is just my little infographic here. Um, different colors are different preservatives. We also examine different biomasses of larval smelt in those. We um, we examined the morphological characteristics um, throughout a 168 day period and looked to see how, uh, how easy it was to identify them after that time period. So at regular intervals, they were examined prior to 160 days. Um, and up on the top right, you can see some of the preservatives did a really great job of preserving morphological characteristics and some did not. And also uh, their current preservative that they have been using 10% formalin does not do a great job of preserving DNA in the preservative. Um, so this is currently in draft. The manuscript is in prep. I think they're almost ready to submit it. And my understanding is that several of the preservatives were good candidates, including ethanol at different concentrations. And they were able to both identify the larval fish as well as extract eDNA from those samples and from the tissue. Um, one consideration too is the method with which we were testing the eDNA. So we used qPCR, but we also used a CRISPR assay, Sherlock, that um, is more sensitive uh, at lower copy numbers and also is less prone to inhibition with ethanol. So stay tuned. Hopefully that'll be out soon. Um, the next study I'll talk about actually was done with a lot of assistance from Genedax or Kramer Fish Sciences, and they helped us both with the experimental design as well as with the controlled studies and the field studies, and we have more studies planned for next season as well. So that's very exciting. Um, the goal for this study was to evaluate some different eDNA tech, um, sampling techniques to see which might be the most appropriate for our field conditions at detecting larval smelt 
in um, low biomasses. So we started with controlled studies. We looked to see, um, number one, does do larval smelt emit eDNA? That's a good one to start with. And yes, they do. I can tell you that. Um, and then also we used that controlled study to determine that the biomass, the eDNA signal concentration increased linearly or sort of linearly with the biomass. So um, that was very useful information that we could then go and apply to our field studies. It also gave us uh, an amount of confidence in our ability to detect them under field conditions, because obviously in a controlled study, you're using much smaller water volumes. You have a much, uh, much higher likelihood of detection than you might if you're looking for one larval smelt in an entire um, channel in the delta. And so we moved into the field. We used live cars with different biomasses and then used a, a number of different sampling techniques, which I should probably mention. Um, the Sterevex filters, very standard, used in a lot of eDNA um, studies. We used another self-preserving filter from Smith Root Incorporated. And they also have a peristaltic pump that's, that's uh, field applicable a tow net, which was able to collect much larger volumes of water. So we may in theory have a higher detection probability from that method. And then lastly, an, um, an autonomous sampler that the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute let us beta test. And that was a really interesting comparison to have because it required zero field effort other than the installation of the instrument. And then it was programmed to take samples at regular intervals for us. So we don't have all the data back from this study yet. Um, the controlled study that we did at the um, FCCL facility with smaller water volumes, we got really helpful information from that, um, we did have some contamination issues from some of our field sampling. So it turns out when you use a boat that is also used to do experimental releases, it has a lot of smelt DNA on it, um, which is valuable information for us in the department to know if we're planning to use this boat for co-sampling. So that was helpful, but we are um, still in the process of, of analyzing that data. Um, we also use the Artemis package that Greg mentioned earlier in his talk, and this has been very helpful for us to determine what our detection probability might be under these different um, scenarios. So, so that is uh, extremely useful. We're looking forward to using that in the next part of the study. Um, the next project I want to talk about is a project that is still in the very early phases. It's uh, targeting harmful algal blooms. And if you were here yesterday, you heard a lot of really great talks about the impacts of har harmful algal blooms in different regions. Um, so maybe I don't need to tell you these things, but they're, they, are, um, they negatively impact various species, including humans. They have detrimental ecosystem effects. And also some other things, I don't know if they were mentioned in the other talks, but um, there is a risk of trophic transfer and accumulation of toxins with some of those blooms. And also changes to uh, the plankton community that we may not fully understand yet, which I think was mentioned yesterday. Um, so for this study, we are going to be using eDNA metabarcoding to uh, answer some of the questions that appear on the right side of the slide, including uh, understanding which species might be present and which might be contributing to the toxic effects of the bloom. Um, also looking at phytoplankton taxonomic diversity and how um, various different taxonomic groups are affected by the blooms and how uh, the, the composition and diversity changes throughout the bloom. So this is definitely a to be continued slide, I believe they are still collecting samples, but have not begun processing them yet. So I'm looking forward to learning more about that project. And then the very last one I'll mention is a, ba a Barker Slough pumping plant aquatic weed removal effort. So we uh, need to remove a lot of aquatic weed um, biomass that accumulates near this pumping plant because the pumps can't operate if they're clogged with aquatic weeds. However, this does pose a risk that we might also be negatively impacting these um, listed species, so longfin and delta smelt. 
So in order to monitor for a larval smelt in tons of aquatic weeds, using a taxonomic ID to sort through that amount of weed biomass is not a very practical solution. And if you've ever tried to find a tr nearly translucent tiny baby fish in one of these samples, it's very impossible. So uh, it was just not a, not a practical um, solution. And so this is a perfect application for an eDNA monitoring approach because um, this is a way for us to get a sense of what, whether there might be negative impacts occurring. And so the uh, protocol for uh, monitoring was developed at the UC Davis Genomic Variation Lab. And they basically rinsed the samples and then filtered the water that was rinsed through the aquatic weeds to see if they were able to detect this target species. And the, um, the results from the initial pilot study, which was done in the spring of 2021, uh, were that they did not detect long fin or larval smelt DNA. However, they did detect a much more common species in many of the samples. So we had confidence that um, the method was able to detect fish DNA in the sample and that most likely we were not um, endangering any of the long fin or delta smelt in the area. And the other important thing I wanted to point out about this project I think it, oh, there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, the other, the last important thing I wanted to mention about this project is that um, this is going to be a pilot study that will continue for the next year. And it's actually mandated in the biological opinion. And so to our knowledge, this is the first mandated um, application of eDNA monitoring in the country. So that's pretty exciting. And um, I'm a little early, but I will um, leave it there. And we have plenty of time for questions. And I just want to thank all the people, both within my group that I um, showed you here on this slide earlier, also the members of Ambari who came out in the field with us, the members of Genedax who ran the larval entrainment study with us, um, the UC Davis Genomic Variation Lab, CDFW, probably some other people that I forgot to say, but, and also thanks to everybody here for a great conference and, and a session. Thank you. Questions for Sarah. Great talk. Thanks. A lot of interesting stuff. Um, when you were doing the eDNA for the larval delta smelt, how are you determining between larval and adults? Thanks for the question. Um, so for that study, we were using known biomasses and we used um, specific age groups. So we, we knew exactly how many days post-attach this group of fish was. We had taken negative field samples immediately prior to doing the live car study to eliminate the chance that there were wild smelt in the area that might also contribute to any positive detections. So we were, we, we were confident that we didn't have any um, naturally occurring smelt DNA that might contribute to our detections. Yeah, and I think they were 35 days post-hatch if I'm remembering correctly, and they were little guys, little cute guys. Do we have any online? No, I have one. Um, Sarah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the Sherlock assay and when you might choose the Sherlock assay versus a qPCR or digital PCR assay. That's a great question. Um, so the Sherlock assay was developed by uh, Melinda Bearwald and others in 2011. No, not 2011. That's the qPCR assay. I'll get back to you on the date. Um, and there are situations where it might be preferable to have an assay that's much more sensitive than qPCR. And for example, in the larval preservation study with the different um, preservatives. So because, because a detection can have management implications, it's very important for us to have the most sensitive 
uh, assay possible for some of these projects. Um, and in some scenarios where qPCR could potentially be inhibited um, by ethanol uh, in another of the preser preservation study preservatives, then Sherlock would be the preferred method there. Um, we have in all of these studies, except for I'm not sure about the Barker Slough pumping plant study, but in all the other ones, we have incorporated qPCR as part of the analysis because that is the standard method and it's it's kind of ground truthing anything we do detect from the CRISPR assays. Um, but we are actively implementing the Sherlock assays in other studies that I didn't mention here as well with, um, with higher sensitivity and great success. So yeah, um, I think it would be project dependent and in a situation where it has management implications, it would be preferable to have the most sensitive assay. So if that answers your question. <laughs> Okay, great. Any other questions? With that, I'd like to thank Sarah again so much and all of our speakers in this session. Thanks everyone. It was a great way to end out. <laughs>